Welcome, Roger. Uh, his session with the U.S. National Academy of Sciences went beyond schedule, but he's now here. His presentation is up, and uh, Roger, as I said earlier, is a senior scientist with the NOAA Physical Labs Laboratory. He has the pleasure of working in Boulder, Colorado, but he's a graduate of York University earlier in his career. So yeah. welcome you. Great. Thanks very much, Gordon, and thanks to everyone for being on. Apologies for being late. I will add that the first paper I ever published was with Stuart Cohen in the CMOS Bulletin a long time ago on climate and food security. So this, it's great to come full circle. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit as, as, as some of the questions that were raised. Well, okay, what if things are more pressing? What, how are we thinking through things? How do we engage people? And in that setting, talk a little bit about how we go from risk to resilience, not forgetting that we need to deal with acceptable risk day-to-day -day activities surrounding specific hazards, but also how we work, integrate, and use science better on this continuum from risk to long-term resilience. A click, please. So change is ahead. We all know that. As I like to say, you don't need to be the Dalai Lama to know that change is ahead. But so is uncertainty. Uncertainty is avoidable, unavoidable and as we move forward over time. Um, I'm going to ask whether or not the uncertainty can actually stop us from action and what makes us uh, take risks in the face of uncertainty. Next. So changes in weather and climate events. We know this to be the case, certainly in our setting. Um, this is a picture from the special report on extremes. Gordon and I were involved in that in the IPCC. It is the most widely used IPCC report. And there's good reason for that, for the questions being asked by this panel. Click, please. So here's the National Academy from the U.S. Um, report on, on uh, S2S, uh, well, subseasonal to seasonal risk, but also on what we know about attribution on event types. Up on the far right, you can certainly know. We know something about extreme heat. We know something about extreme cold. But when we get down to the lower levels of uncertainties and our confidence by attributing changes, up come severe convective storms, extratropical cyclones, wildfires, tropical cyclones, extreme snow, extreme rainfall. Together with that, click please, are is an understanding that we don't simply respond to one event at a time. We have to respond to multiple events at multiple time scales, and these require different efforts and different kinds of investments. So adaptation spans multiple activities and scales, click. And we have been able to document worldwide that, that where some things are being done in agriculture, in energy, in hydropower, reservoir management, click please, and in which we can actually talk about with businesses such as AECOM, IBM, UN, through the UNDR process, what is needed, what types of impacts do we look at on sub-decade, on decadal, on months to years, weeks to months, and years and sub-decades. And this is a really critical way of looking at issues, but what I want to get at is that in an increasingly complex, complex world, while we think of a linear risk process as dealing with the impact and the response and the assessment on each of these time scales, it is the actual interaction of the time scales that is creating our complexity. And, and we all know that. The question is, how do we deal with it? Click, please. So there are great benefits. Early warning systems were shown by the World Bank, saves lives and assets worth at least 10 times their cost. Um, we were able to show how this worked in the Caribbean during the 2017 uh, massive hurricane season, but also how it helped in the 2013 to 2016 drought event. We know that investing money on better dryland farming yields a certain benefit. We know investments enable more efficient use of water brings benefits and $1 trillion. And, and these are round big numbers, right? And a, a lot done by Stefan Halgat and others um, would generate $4 trillion in benefits. I'm not going for the accuracy, but the scale of this one to four, the idea that some upfront investment can save us into the long term, but how long is the long term when tomorrow is the thing that matters? Next slide. So I, I was the convening lead author on adaptation, uh, both in the last IPCC, but also for the US National Assessment. And we documented a lot of activities and responses since the third national assessment in 2014. This is from the 2018 report that I was involved in as well. Implementation has increased, but it's not yet commonplace. It is very similar to Paul's question of, well, if we know what we ought to do and we have the tools and we understand some of the costs, why aren't we acting? So this becomes very critical because in the next click, 
The report for the Sustainable Development Goals, I chair SDG 6 on water for the US, says something similar. Pathways to generate the transformation required to meet these goals are not yet advancing at the speed or scale required, even though we know what we ought to do. There's impacts and actions. So next click. So we know there will be more outbreaks as a consequence of extreme weather, biodiversity destruction, and political instability. That sounds like COVID-19, but that statement is actually, click please, from a book called Fire in Paradise on the California fires, the most destructive natural hazard, probably in, uh, even more so in terms of economics than Katrina um, and Hurricane Sandy and so on. And we estimate that it's about $80 billion just in California alone. So we know that the collective timescales and the interactions of both the risk and the uncertainties produces what we call systemic risk. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is get at not just responding to simple risk, which is critical. Uh, it looks like it's wet outside. We might be slipping before we step outside. Got to carry umbrella, got to get better shoes. The complicated risk, we are seeing hotter droughts impacting vegetation to complex compounding and cascading risk. And this has become common to talk about, but not yet common in terms of how we respond to some of these very complex risks. And traditional risk management and management strategies are increasingly challenged by the nature of these systemic and evolving impacts of the cross time scales aspect of climate. So what do we do about them? That uh, figure on calculated and perceived risk was in the special report on extremes. And it was one of the first times we tried to get our heads around how do we manage from droughts to floods to wildfires and back. Next slide. So here's one example and we're drawing this out in the, um, I'm one of the convening authors on the global uh, assessment report for the UN uh, Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, and Gordon's work a long time with them. There's globally networked risk. Modern food systems are highly dynamic, complex, formal, and informal. And you can see the main trade flows of corn, wheat, soybean, complex, and palm oil. Coffee is even more complex than that. Next slide. But what we're seeing is the current context, the stressors, sudden and gradual tipping points, and systemic failures in some cases. Environmental degradation, uh, agricultural technical limits, the complexity of trade, water conflicts, uh, is somehow over um, you know, trade and demand, uh, market volatility, giving rise to impacts in different parts of the world. Years ago, we did a study on the, um, the impact of uh, droughts in the middle of the United States, building on the 1950s event, and basically since then, when there's a major drought in the US, the US itself is no longer affected directly as they were in the 1930s, but it's the places that import cheap wheat from the US that begins to be affected, and the trade-offs in the market with Canada, Brazil, and elsewhere. So this is a globally networked way of looking at risk and failure. But another part of systemic risk, next slide, has to do with how we optimize what we're looking at. We're optimizing for stability. This system, even though it looks like that, is actually assuming stable environments. That's how we do our trade. That's how we do our movement of cash flow. That's how we do our shipping up and down the Mississippi. Right now, we're in the middle of working with the Mississippi mayors on trying to manage upper Midwest flooding, a hurricane season that looks like it's going to be extremely active and it started that way, with how the mayors in New Orleans and Baton Rouge will manage emergency shelters, planning, and so on in a time of a pandemic. This is a very complex set of driven features from more than one type of extreme. Next slide. But these globally networked risks also drive and play a role in local imbalances. We work quite a bit on with the, the way indigenous peoples in the US are developing uh, climate change impacts and planning, but sometimes click, the drivers are huge. The increased temperature and dryness in the Four Corners, the Southwest, where the Diné people, the um, Hopi, Wallapai, and so on are, we're seeing increased sand dune migration. And in addition to that, the dust from those sand dunes going onto the snowpack on the Southern Rockies, causing early melt and so on. So a colleague, close colleague of mine from Northern Arapa says, with drought, tribes are the first affected. They're the ones on the ground who sustain themselves with subsistence, hunting, fishing, and gardening. Many of the folks living in that region while facing these threats are also looking at how 
novel ecosystems are arising and how new plants and practices and become engaged in their cultural practices to the extent that some of the things that were developed in the Four Corners region on riparian control of erosion is now you being used by the city of Albuquerque. So you have impacted people, but also people who are impacted and showing what they've done over the long term to learn and manage risk. Some of these local imbalances are driven by larger scale dynamics of droughts and floods globally that are related to those systemic risks. Next slide. So if we know what to do, why aren't we doing better? Now this comes from a mentor of mine uh, from years ago, a guy by the name of Gilbert White. And Gilbert um, used to ask the question, if we know better, why aren't we doing better? Now we're doing a lot of things that are better. I showed some cases in which um, in the US and some examples globally from the Ad Global Adaptation Coalition on where things are being done. But as Paul was just mentioning, we have those and we have cases and we have some examples, but we are not thinking about how we address these as a broader society outside of projects. One of the reasons is that like the Financial Times said, people are afraid that doing something about climate will, will make them poorer or less well off. That's the first thing that put up there. I call this, we, we like to think, you know, that the knowledge deficit shouldn't be a barrier to us action. This is a deficit of admitting what the problems are. So next slide. So if we only knew the cost and benefits, we would ask, we would act differently, or so we think. Or as the young person says, if we learn from our mistakes, shouldn't we be making as many mistakes as possible? So the question is, is it true that if we know the costs and benefits that that will actually help us to act? Next. Here's a study, I was involved in the review process on this, for Natural Hazard Mitigation Save, the 2017 Assessing Future Savings from Risk Mitigation. Please just click. So, wildland urban interface, we know investing $1 can save three to four dollars. We know river for rivering flooding, one can save five to seven dollars, one to five for winds, and for hurricane surge, one to seven. So we know the benefits of investing a dollar up front. But why are our comment actions not completely commensurate with knowing that cost and benefit? Next slide. And one of the reasons why is the choice that we have to make about land use planning and design, novel configurations of land use, is actually the biggest return on investment. And those are the hardest policy decisions to make. It's easier just to say, let's retrofit. And even then, we don't do it at the scale that's needed. So let's keep that in mind that we've shown the fact that the cost and benefits, actually, we know something about it. And adaptations do not, let's go back, go back, please. Okay, next slide. And in addition to those investments, adaptations do not always require major investments. Here's a simple set of efforts. Actually, we have some going up on like this just above the hill where I live in Boulder, Colorado at the time. We're introducing beavers basically to get at strengthening watershed functions. And we're seeing good cases in which this happens. This is a very simple, very direct effort. And all of these scales matter, both the investment for things like hurricane surge and the level at which these actions take place. So there's a mix of actors, public, private, academia, and civil society mechanisms. Those are the people that are actually doing this work. Next. Next. So here's another thing we say, if we could only assess future risks with greater certainty. Well, there's an old Chinese, Chinese problem that says, if we're not careful, we'll end up where we are going. How certain do we need to know the future with what great precision when you look at a map like this and you could say, I think I know where this is going in terms of water demand and in terms of uh, food uh, import issues and so on. So next, next, right. This is one study done, I mean, not even a study, this was actually an implementation long before the California drought, done by Paula Kehoe from the San Francisco Public Utility, and she and I wrote up a piece on the risks that people take trying to do things up front. But in this case, that is a real picture that you're looking at, both of them. And you could see the top of the San Francisco uh, Transportation Building, up to 95% of demands are non-potable in commercial buildings. In the last five years, Every new building, major building in San Francisco, over 250,000 square feet, big office buildings, transportation hubs, now have to have a green top. And that green top is agreed to by the health sector, by the health department, by transportation, by a network of people working to maintain the protection of the green roof. 
So there are opportunities to rethink our building design and reimagine how water is used that actually are not sometimes put into place when we constantly think, okay, until we know the future, eh, exactly, we shouldn't be acting. Yet this was put into place in California and some of our other cities are trying to do this now. Next slide. But there's a bigger sort of issue around those drivers. If we look at this figure, which is in um, the National Climate Assessment, I was also on the water chapter, um, since done by Peter Rogers, then Peter Glick took up some of the data and then we put it in the national assessment in the effort we were, we were doing. Since 1995, the, no, the amount of water withdrawals in the United States has leveled off. The total amount of water use, not just per capita, not just, this is the total amount of water withdrawals in use is actually leveling off. Look at the US GDP. Do you see a big impact on having made these actions? You can't. And this is one of the cases, and we see it in energy as well, in which we can basically say, look, a set of actions have taken place and efficiency and better productivity from smaller amounts of water use did not in fact impact our well-being in the way the Financial Times was saying people were saying it would be. So click. So efficient technology was introduced since about 1973. There was the Clean Water Act for managing things a little bit more, the quality that you get and what you can recycle and use and behavioral changes in terms of efficiency. And these are well documented. And the most important thing there is there's the leveling off and we cannot show that there's been a loss of economic competitiveness, which is usually the dodge that's put up for action. Next slide. What's the next thing? Well, if only we get the communication right. Communication is critical, but it is not sufficient. The combination of supply and demand for information is not linear in terms of what do you want and how can I provide it, even if it's wrong, and is more than two way. The tougher thing to do, next slide, in communication, next, is understanding how the different people and institutions who work with socialize their lessons from the past, precisely as uh, Paul and others were, was saying. This is a figure I drew years ago uh, from a set of studies um, that Kathy Jacobs and I did on just the difference uh, through interviews and otherwise, there's the water manager's perspective, and we're generalizing about that, and there's a researcher's perspective. Completely different answers on critical issues, time frames, spatial resolution, goals, basis for decisions, expectation, product characteristic, and the entire frame. Years ago, we understood, yes, water managers and others have their frame. Energy folks, community builders, but so do researchers. And so we need to basically understand when we go into such settings, Various the communication also includes us. Next slide. The other thing we do is, you know, coming out of the forecasting community and given the many uncertainties, you say, well, predict, then act. This nice figure on the top is from a study by Rob Lempert that I've added to. He and I are working on a set of this idea of if the uncertainties are underestimated because of complexity, competing analyses then contribute to gridlock, and I see it in and yeah, when we deal with the public, as, as Gordon knows, we do, from every level to con from Congress to local levels. And misplaced concreteness about the future can increase decision makers' vulnerability to surprise. So as a result, it's easy to underestimate the complexities of adaptation. Or well, as Nostradamus might have said, I did not see that coming. But if we actually understand the uncertainty, or if we understand the context by which we make decisions, it is not truly a surprise. So where does that leave us? Click. It tells us that factoring resiliency in systems design and planning is still the safest approach from risk to resilience. And we need a shared concept and indicators that drives us and links the continuum between risk-based, probabilistic risk-based approaches and those that are there to help us manage uncertainty and resilience. As we like to say, we're not simply managing for change, we have to manage through change. Next. So moving forward, where are we? Integrated approaches to managing risk and resilience and the use of windows. We have to acknowledge the cross-scale nature of early warning information that goes from the emergency response to thresholds and surprises. The fact that in systemic risk, in our global trade network, in our uh, communications network, on energy, on water, there are stability domains that we are assuming exist. And we saw them disrupted, and we are seeing them disrupted at the moment. There's entry points and opportunities from information and interventions. And so our partnerships lead us 
to think through how to get at that. And I think that's the brilliance of these two sessions that um, Gordon put together, is that trying to get at, yes, if we have these thresholds, stability domains, and cascading risk, what are our entry points for opportunities and inf intervention? Next slide, please. Where might investments be prioritized to reduce future risk across the continuum? not just in response to something that has happened or simply planning for something like what has already happened. Next. The best metrics approach thinking through resilience is to look for the long-term benefits of addressing near-term risk. Next slide. And how we think through some of this, and th this is in a paper that uh, Igor Linkov uh, from the Corps of Engineers, myself and a bunch of other folks did on Five how minutes. we create a tiered approach to yeah, thank you, to linking risk and, and um, resilience, the physical, informational, cognitive, and social aspects. Click. Click. Across how we prepare. Okay, back. Back, please. How we pre go across, prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt. So as we take our different things from home, neighborhood, town, county, region, state, country, and even country regions, we think about, okay, the informational basis across all of these from physical to social, cognitive, and information in the different stages of preparing absorption, recovery, and adaptation, and each of the entry points for finance. And I, we have a lot of work going on with the World Bank and others on where the liquidity needs to be placed to get the most benefit. Next slide. So. The actor network in all of that needs broadening. Public and private sector, yes. Academia, yes, but also civil society. To ensure political authority and policy coherence, next. To develop the culture of partnerships beyond, with a, a social basis for risk communication, next. To decentralize step-by-step -step while maintaining accountability, efficiency, and standards, next. And to get us past this simplified notion of co-production, which usually leads to co-optation. In other words, we co-produce with one group and then marginalize others. Partners do not just share data, they also share risks and responsibilities. And it is for this reason um, we developed the Regional Integrated Sciences um, Assessment Program, which now has 11 um, research entities funded for five years um, each time, run by, uh, folks in academia, but bringing in public, private, and local folks in each region so that they are not just simply saying, give me your data and analyze it and give you back a, a, the paper and we will have co-produced, but we are actually sharing the risks and responsibilities in your region. Next slide. And so arrangements for how individuals and institutional learning and co-production can occur without co-optation. That's the big challenge. Next slide. So in beginning to think through this, what is the fundamental question of adaptation? The fundamental question is not simply, as I like to say, you know, perfect planning is a figment in the mind of the planner, right? I have this plan today, it's gonna last forever. Well, of course not. The fundamental question is how often should criteria for robustness be reconsidered and tested? Next slide. And one, one figure we took in the National Climate Assessment um, for 2018 in the US was trying to map where we've seen awareness, assessment, planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation goes forward through the different adaptive cycles and how leadership partnerships and stakeholders are engaged. And so it's iterative because that's the nature of collaborative learning for emergent risks. Last, next slide. So, oh, sorry, uh, the one thing I do want to mention is one piece that was coming up in the previous talk as well we're looking very closely at how we get systematic alignment. That is the shared visions, implementation and financing among the Paris, the UNFCCC agreements, click. The 2030 agenda for SDGs and click. And the first full post-Sendai um, assessment for the UN Dis Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, taking the plans for disaster risk reduction and the assessment, integrating across risk to resilience, hopefully, but to 2030, not for some long further out issue. Can we get there? And how do we align the funding, implementation and financing on the disaster risk to climate adaptation continuum? Next slide. And how it's funded, the, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda is basically part of the discussion on how it might be financed. And we can talk about that in, during the question period as well. Next. <laughs> 
So what's our final challenge? It's to sustain the collaborative learning networks across research, observation, services, and decision-making. As Gordon showed, we have the notion of linked risks, and these have not changed for a long time in the World Economic Forum reports. We've drawn out pathways of action that can lead us to increasing systemic risk or decreasing paths, depending on where we go. And the fundamental challenge for the research community is ensuring that monitoring, observations, forecasting, impacts assessment and scenarios, communication, and planning and preparedness all move ahead at the same time. We make a big distinction between communication and embedding and planning and preparedness. Last click. And I like to show this little red slide on the right here simply because, as I like to tell people, human, the human mind is wonderful. If you give us a complex problem, someday we're going to solve it. It's the obvious that takes us longer to understand. But even the littlest among us know that a little collaboration could get some water to the most vulnerable. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Roger. Um, we are running behind schedule, so I won't... Uh, uh, your presentation was really excellent. And uh, one of the questions that was asked was, are these slides going to be available in terms of uh, being on, on a website? And uh, um, let's say that Paul, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction has avail made avail will make available to all of the speakers who wish to have them to have their presentations put on the ICLR website. Uh, and uh, I meant to ask you this formally in a letter earlier, so I'll, we'll send it around, but we'll work with you to make sure that this is up. And I could just say to thank Roger, who also not only great, gave this great talk, but initiated the idea of preparing a report that would summarize the, the discussion, the, the, the presentations, the discussions across the ones, and we're, we're, we'll work on that one too. So uh, 